welcome everyone to um, Andrew's introduction of, of, of Tax for Landlords. Um, my name is Debbie Franklin, I'm the Area Manager for Andrew's Letting and Management, um, part of the group of Andrew's. Um, can I just, um, just a few housekeeping sort of things. Um, can I ask people to, if you have got a phone, uh, can you just check that it's on silent or turned off just so it doesn't interrupt and sort of embarrassing sort of songs that come out of it. Um, and also maybe just ask people to shift along a little bit just in case we do get any people come in so it saves dis disturbing. Um, there's not forecast to be or not due to be a fire alarm this evening. So if the fire alarm does go off, then we would need to exit the building and coming out the way very slowly to the way that obviously you came in. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. The event's been sponsored by our Andrews Mortgage Services side of the business. And tonight, obviously, we're going to be talking and we've partnered with a tax specialist to be able to give you all the updates. Obviously, there were changes in the budget yesterday, so um, hopefully it gets sort of hot off the press. Um, and we have got some handouts to give out at the end as well with regards to the budget um, changes as well, as well as some a list of lots of lists of investment properties for those landlords that may be interested in um, expanding their portfolios. Um, also, at the end of the session, we will also be doing a and A. So, if there's any questions, if you could probably perhaps save them until the end of the session, and and there'll be a and A then. If you're not comfortable actually asking in this sort of this type of forum, quite happy for people to. We've got staff here lots of staff from all aspects of the business that we're quite happy for, to talk one-on-one -on -one if you'd like to stay behind at the end to uh, ask anybody individual questions. <clears throat> for those people who've, um, if you don't know much about Andrews, we've been established in 1946, so actually next year I'm very pleased to say is actually our 70th year, so I'm um, very proud of our sort of heritage and that side of things. We, we are across the southeast and the southwest uh, um, of England really and we've got 85 branches and we don't just cover sales and lettings we cover an awful lot more of really everything under the property um, umbrella really we've got a land in new homes um, side of the business we have a financial services side we have a surveying business um, we have an asset management business as well that deals with uh, properties that we manage all around the country um, in England and, and Scotland and, and Wales as well. We have a leasehold uh, management as well, so if those of you have got flats, you know you may have a block management company, we do that as well. So if you're interested, not very happy with your existing um, business, then we can help there. Um, and land in new homes as well, so lots of aspects of anything to do with property, we've got the experience and the knowledge to be able to pass on to you. So any questions to do with that, we have got representatives from um, virtually all of the groups here tonight. Um, in terms of, I, I come from Andrews Letting and Management and obviously as landlords that's the side of the business that my expertise and knowledge is in. Um, I've worked for the company actually for 25 years so I've seen lots of changes over that time, especially in the legislation. Um, and there's an, an awful lot of raft of le legislation forever changing, but we, uh, Andrews, can keep you up to date with all of that legislation. We let um, over 7,000, um, uh, we had 7,000 landlords let their properties through Andrews last year through our extensive network. So we've got an awful lot of market knowledge as well across that whole network. So if you're looking to expand your portfolio, we can advise you on the places to buy, where you can get your best yields, or whether you're looking for capital appreciation as well. Um, we, we have a tenant demand is absolutely huge at the moment. We've got on average about 1,000 tenants registering with a week. And certain pockets, I know from Bristol, I cover Bristol, Bath and, and um, parts of Gloucestershire. And in Bristol at the moment, we've got around... Um, in certain areas, we've got 25 applicants to every one property, so the, the demand is there. Um, and obviously, the, the thing with the demand, what we pride ourselves on, is making sure that you keep your void periods as short as possible. So, and that's something that we know is quite often uh, something you don't want to, because it's not earning you money during that time. Very pleased to say we're also multi-award winning. You can see from all the um, medals there that we've actually won an awful lot of awards um, across the industry. For, for various bits of our service and very proud to, to have that. 
And we, we're also mar uh, members of ARLA, which is the Association of Residential Letting Agents, and the Property Ombudsman as well. And our staff are actually trained um, and actually take exams, industry recognised exams as well, so they've got the knowledge and expertise to pass on to you. What I'm going to do today now is pass over to our tax specialist, who we've partnered with from um, Bishop Fleming. So I'm going to introduce you and pass you over to Karen. Hi, thanks Debbie. Um, my name's Karen Press. I'm a Chartered Tax Advisor. I've um, been working in tax for about 19 years now. Um, and probably the last six or seven years really specialised in property. Um, we now have seven offices um, throughout the South West. Um, we've now got 24 partners and 300 staff and we offer the full service of accountancy practice <laughs> from sole trade accounts and tax returns right up to big limited companies or corporation tax returns and of course all of the planning that goes with that as well to ensure that our clients get a full overall service not only of the compliance they need to do but also the planning to help them um, reduce their tax exposure legitimately. I'm going to cover tonight an introduction to tax. Um, as we know, I actually wrote this presentation last week, so uh, I will put in a couple of pointers where it's changed yesterday. Um, and like Debbie did say, there are some handouts to go with you as well to put the main three points for any landlord, and hopefully you can have those on the way out. Um, but tonight I'm just going to cover the introduction, basically what your responsibilities are as a landlord in respect of completing tax returns um, and paying your tax. Recap on the allowable rental expenses for you to make sure you're claiming everything that you can. Give an overview of the tax rates. Um, that's as of April this year. Obviously, we had an announcement um, for what's coming next year, but we're going to focus on what's happening in the current tax year. And also cover a few tax planning points as well, just so you can see what you can look to do in the future with your property. First off, rental income is taxable. Anyone who's in receipt of rental income does have to do a self-assessment tax to each year and pay their tax accordingly. The first year that you obtain a rental property, you have got a bit of time before you need to register with HMRC, and that is the 5th of October following the tax year that you start to receive income. So if I buy a rental property tomorrow, we're in the current tax year of 2015-16, I do have until the 5th of October 2016 to register with HMRC to let them know I'm in receipt of this income and that I need to prepare self-assessment tax returns. So we have got quite a bit of time um, if you are looking to buy a property before you have to um, get everything into the revenue. In terms of submission deadlines, if you file by a paper tax return, you have until the 31st of October to submit that tax return. So in me buying a new property this week, my first tax return by paper would be due in the 31st of October 2016. If I file that tax return online, my deadline extends slightly to the 31st of January 2017. As you can see, potentially, I could be in receipt of quite a bit of rental income before I have my first tax payment to make. So it's quite important for any new landlord that they are aware of what they need to be keeping for records and expenses they can be claiming. The tax due each year is is also payable on the 31st of January. So if I buy a new property this week, first payment, end of January 2017. And also, if I make a loss in this particular tax year, again, it's wise to disclose that on your tax return. The reason I say that is because rental losses are actually allowed to be carried forward and set against rental profits. So if I buy a property this week and I need to replace the kitchen and bathroom and want to redecorate it, before I put it to an agent to rent it. Obviously, I've got quite a bit of cost, as well as paying the mortgage and the insurance, so possibly I may make a loss in the first year, and it's very important that I keep a record of that and file it with the revenue, so that that can be taken into account in the next tax year when I make some profits. So if I made a loss of, say, £1,000 in the 2015-16 tax year, and made a profit of £3,000 the following tax year, I would actually be assessed to tax on the £2,000, so I'd get the £1,000 off of my £3,000 profit. We have got a couple of nasty slides at the beginning, I'm afraid, so we will get a bit better as we go further on. 
Um, this is just really just a reminder on the late tax return filing penalties. As I said, a tax return for the 2015-16 tax year has to be filed by the latest online, the 31st of January 2017. If it's a day late, it's a £100 penalty, full stop. Obviously, the later it goes, as you can see, the higher the penalties go and the more they ramp up. In addition to a late filing penalty, if you pay the tax due late as well, as you can see, instantly we've got a daily rate of 3% of interest on the monies owed to the revenue. If the tax is 30 days late, it's a 5% surcharge, and again, as time goes on, the quicker they ramp up. So I can't stress enough, really, the importance of getting your tax return completed, filed on time, and any tax paid on time. Record keeping. Just a quick note on this. As I said, I could buy a property tomorrow and I haven't got to do my, complete my tax return and file it until the 31st of January 2017. The records to support the figures on that tax return need to be kept until the 31st of January 2022. So we're talking quite a long time. If I buy a property tomorrow, how long I need to keep the records for? And that's records detailing the income, the expenses, and essentially the records to back up the figures that I'm going to put on my tax return, which I'm disclosing is my income position. I normally advise clients when they first buy a rental property, if possible, to open up a separate bank account and have the income paid into that bank account, the mortgage coming out of that bank account, any expenses you may pay yourself, maybe some redecoration or an emergency plumber, anything like that, pay it out of that one bank account. If HMRC do at any point want to make an inquiry into your tax return, they will want to see not only the records you've kept, but also the bank statements relating to where the income's gone. So obviously if you've got one separate account with everything going in, all the expenses going out, you just hand over the one set of bank statements with the supporting documents. Just a quick note there on um, penalty. If for any reason the revenue do inquire into your tax return and you have made what's called a careless error, something as simple as putting in maybe 13 months of the mortgage interest rather than 12, that would be a careless error. The revenue could give you a tax-based penalty of up to 30% of the tax that was they deemed to be underpaid. So as with anything for self-assessment, keep your records, prepare your tax returns on time, pay your tax on time, and obviously keep everything neat and tidy and filed in tax years. A note here on the residential campaign. Um, this was launched by the Revenue back in about the autumn of 2013. Um, they had a view that potentially one in three landlords weren't disclosing their income to them each year. Um, and I think they were banding around a figure of about 500 million of tax underpaid each year. So they've, they've launched this campaign to try and encourage landlords that may not have been doing self-assessment returns to come forward to them to let them know they have been in receipt of this income and basically to settle up with them. This would cover all landlords, whether you've got furnished holiday lets, some student properties, it would cover everybody. And as with anything with the revenue, their view is if you approach them with the information and the disclosure, obviously they give you the best possible terms. The penalties, etc., could be less. If you are in that situation or know anybody that is in that situation, it is quite an easy process to, to sort with the revenue. You need to notify them, which you can do online quite easily. And then within three months of that, you need to actually disclose to them and self-assess your tax position. Now, effectively, you need to do your own income and expenditure for the tax years concerned, calculate the tax due, obviously the interest, and what penalty they see you calculate as due. Um, there is an online calculator on the Revenues website for anyone who's interested, and of course, pay the tax. Um, alternatively, you could obviously speak to a tax advisor who could just ensure that you are claiming all the expenses and, and do that for you. The revenue, this is an ongoing campaign, the revenue haven't said at any point it's due to finish and they will use whatever information they can to find landlords. They can use a land, they can access land registry, they can also obtain information from letting agents and also companies that hold your deposits. So 
anyone in that situation, just contact me or just look online on the revenue website. To be fair, it's quite easy to follow. I'm just going to go through now the allowable expenditure. Here is the first slide where uh, I will need to detour from my uh, usual talk. Okay. As a landlord, you do incur a lot of expenses on your property. I'm just going to run through what you can actually claim on an annual basis against your rental income. First off, the agent and management fees. If you pay Andrews to manage your properties, that is an allowable deduction against your rental income and should be claimed in full every year. The mortgage interest that you pay on the borrowing to buy the buy to let, again, is allowable in full, with asterisks, we'll come back to that later, as it stands at the moment. If you do have a repayment mortgage, just need to be aware it's only the interest element that you can claim as a deduction, not the full monthly payment. Also, if you do remortgage um, and you have an arrangement fee, that again is deductible in the year that you pay that. Repairs and maintenance, leaky taps, doors that won't open, everything like that. Any repair to the property is an allowable expense and should be claimed in full. If your properties aren't local to you and you do travel to them to go and do maybe the check-in, do a three-month check, six-month check, go and meet the plumber there to let him in to fix the leaky tap, all of that mileage is allowable and that's at 45 pence per mile. So if you've got a few properties and they're a distance away, keep a record of the mileage because you can use that as a deduction as well. Legal and professional fees. If you employ an accountant to do your tax return, you can claim that again in full each year. And wear and tear allowance, asterisks until 5th of April 2016. As it stands at the moment, if you have a furnished property, and by that I mean there's a bed to sleep in, there's sofa, there's chairs, there's wardrobes, you can currently claim a 10% deduction each year of your gross rents for the wear and tear allowance. Um, unfortunately, announced yesterday from April 2016, um, the revenue are looking to change that and you can only claim for expenditure incurred. Um, we will find out more about that next week, but for those of you that do have furnished properties, just be aware that there will be a change from next April for you on the amount you can claim. Nearly every penny currently that you spend on your rental property can be allowable for tax. As you can see, I've got a cross through the property enhancements. And the reason that's got a cross is because that's the only one you need to take into account when you sell the property. Property enhancements these days really are if you build an extension or you go up and put a loft room, or maybe you buy a property and put individual shower rooms in some of the bedrooms, that is a property enhancement. And you will get tax relief for that when you come to sell the property. So again, keep the record of the purchase keep the record of any, any capital expenditure because you will get relief for that when you come to sell the property. Um, like I said, nearly every penny at the moment is allowable. Um, again, asterisks was um, pre-yesterday. People, landlords that have got unfurnished properties, obviously from 6th of April 2013, could no longer claim for the replacement of white goods or carpets and curtains. If you had a property and your fridge freezer breaks and you have to replace it with new, you do not get a deduction for that on an unfurnished property. The exception to that is only where you have got integrated items in your kitchen. So if you have an integrated washing machine and it breaks, you can replace the washing machine and you can claim that as a deduction. And the reason being is it is deemed to be part of the fixtures and fittings of the kitchen rather than a freestanding item. Obviously, if you need to repair any of those items, say the washing machine door breaks, you can claim that in full because it's a repair. It's purely the replacement that this legislation covered with effect from the 6th of April 2013 for landlords with unfurnished properties. If I just add on the extras, there you are, we'll come through. Um, tax rates. With effect from April this year, each individual, providing their income is below £100,000, we use that as a cap for tonight, has a personal allowance of £10,600. That is the amount that every individual can earn before they pay any income tax. Once you've used that, you then have two brackets effectively, 
first the basic rate tax bracket. So if your income after the personal allowance is within the 31,785, you pay tax at 20%. If it's above that, up to 150,000, you pay tax at 40%, then we have the higher bracket paying tax at 45%. As we all know, rental income is not taxed at source. We receive the income gross. And therefore, if when you add your rental income to your other income you may have, if it keeps you within the 20% tax bracket, you pay tax at 20%. If you're over, you pay tax at 40%. And if you're straddling it, to so say your income after your personal allowance is 30000 and your rental income is 5000 you pay some tax on that at 20% and some at 40%. Very similar to the way the capital gains tax rates work as well, um, each individual currently has an annual exemption of £11,100. If we sell a rental property, the first £11,100 is exempt for capital gains tax. After that, the same rules apply. Add, your, add all of your income, including your rental income, and if your gain on top of that keeps you in the basic rate tax band, the capital gain is 18%. If you're already in excess of the basic rate band limit, it's capital gains tax at 28%. And if we're in that little bracket again, you might pay some at 18% and some at 28%. Tax planning. So I said I'd brighten it up towards the end. <laughs> Obviously, if you've got a rental property, there are quite a number of tax planning um, opportunities for you and things that you should be considering. I'm just going to cover a few of them tonight um, and go through some of them quite quickly. So if you've got any questions, please come and see me at the end. Some of them are quite complex to try and get across on a, on a group basis. Normally do it on a one-to-one, -one, but bear with me and hopefully we'll get there. But if not, then say catch me at the end. Mortgage. As I mentioned earlier on, your mortgage interest is an allowable deduction against your rental income. Just got an example here of a typical client that we see. They've got a main home and they've also got a mortgage on the main home. They've also got a rental property and a mortgage on the rental property. And hopefully, if nothing else, they're claiming the loan interest on the rental property. Asterix, obviously, this will change from April 2017, and it will be phased in over four years. But currently, as it stands, you can claim um, up to 45% 40, income tax relief on your loan interest that you pay on your buy-to-let. So here we are. We've got an individual who has a mortgage of £100,000 on their buy-to-let, I'm assuming a rate of interest at 3%. Um, John will obviously tell me shortly that you can probably get a much bit better deal than that, but we're going to use that for illustration. So an individual would have the mortgage, they would pay £3,000 interest on that mortgage, and if they're a basic rate taxpayer, that would save them £600 a year. If they're a higher rate taxpayer, it would save them £1,200 a year. Now, as you can see... Overall, we have got a mortgage of £250,000 between the two properties, and the rental property has got a value of two hundred and fifty. pounds And for these purposes, value means what you initially <coughs> bought the property for at day one, if you've bought it purely to rent it, or if you've lived in that property and then rented it out and bought another property, the market value at the date that you introduced that property into your rental portfolio. And that's, that's quite an important, we'll come to that in a second. But as you can see, overall, we've got mortgages of £250,000, and we've actually got a value of our rental property of £250,000. And what we want to achieve, effectively, um, asterisks until the, the rules change for everybody, is the total mortgages having the loan interest deducted against your rental income. As you can see, my figures type quite nicely. Value of the buy to let, 250, mortgages, 250,000. So, how do we do this? Well, rental properties are now deemed to be business for tax purposes, and therefore, under that criteria, if you have borrowed to invest capital in a business, you are eligible to claim the loan interest on any money borrowed to repay the capital to you. So in most cases, on the scenario there, somebody may have put £150,000 of cash or maybe inheritance into a buy-to-let, but they may have funded it from the main home. But as we saw from the slide, the property 
has got a value of 250 and a mortgage of only 100 and we want to obtain tax relief on the full 250,000. I've just put a little note here about the restriction. Obviously, as I've said, the market value of the property at the date of purchase or when you rent it, that is the ceiling. So say in, in the scenario we've got here, actually the market value of that property now is 350,000, we're still capped. We can only ever claim mortgage interest relief up to the 250,000 pounds that we initially bought it for. And that's quite an important point. Um, and basically what we need to do effectively is just restructure those loans. So we've got a loan on the main residence, we've got a loan on the buy to let. If we remortgage the main home, do not increase the amount still keep the £150,000 borrowing, but if we get a new loan, move it from lender to lender or move to a different product so we generate a new loan document being prepared, we can do a declaration and we can say that loan was to repay my capital. And from that point onwards, you can claim the loan interest against your rental income on the £150,000 on your main home. And that is obviously very good. Like I say, the rules are changing in 2017, um, but we're still going to get basic rate relief even if you're a higher rate taxpayer, so it's still something to, to look at. Um, the main points on that where it may not be applicable, it might not be applicable for anybody that has got a very good tracker on their current main home mortgage. You know, you may be paying 1% on that mortgage. For tax purposes, yes, remortgage, um, move it, be able to claim the loan interest relief but not if it's going to cost you. You could move to a mortgage of 2 2.5%, two and, and overall, you might not be saving any money. Similarly, if you've currently got a tie-in period with your current provider, maybe you've got 18 months to go, um, and you've got a hefty redemption penalty, again, it can just be looked at in 18 months' time. Um, we don't advise you to put yourself in a worse position. Some things are better from a tax perspective, but actually overall it may not be beneficial for you. And nobody wants to pay a redemption penalty that's quite hefty, and nobody really wants to move from a very, very good mortgage rate on their main home. So it might not be suitable for everybody, but if it is suitable, it's, it's well worth considering. Back to my initial slide beginning, here is the optimum position. We've still got the main home with the same value, the rental property with the same purchase price, and I've put the, the full mortgage into the rental property. That means basically now we're claiming all of the loan interest. So previously we were claiming on the 100, now we're claiming on the 250. For a basic rate taxpayer, your tax saving has gone from 600 pounds to 1500. And for a basic rate taxpayer, it's gone from 1200 to 3000. Like I say, just need to keep an eye on that for obviously future changes, and we will know more next week about that that's coming in in 2017. Another option you may have is equalising income. This applies if you have got a husband and wife or you are in a civil partnership and you own a property jointly. As we've discussed, the basic rate band and the higher rate band, you may have one spouse paying tax at 20% and one spouse paying tax at 40%. If you own that property jointly, then you can look to alter the percentage share of the property. So you currently own it 50-50, but say your partner only pays tax at 20% and you're paying it at 40, if you can shift more into their name, so they're declaring more on their tax return, overall between you, you are saving income tax, and that's each year. Any transfer of ownership between married couples or civil partners is not subject to any capital gains tax, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, and you can look to move the percentages if you need to in the future. The only thing to point out on that is that you do need to do a declaration to confirm that you know you are giving your partner a share in the property and also you do need to submit a form 17 to HMRC so we can't unfortunately backdate anything but you can do this from a point now and use it going forward indefinitely. Um, you would just want to consider the position potentially prior to a sale of that property to see if there's any benefit in changing the percentages a different way to maximise your capital gains tax annual exemption position. But, you know, very, very good, very good planning tool if it, if it fits in to people's situations. PPR relief. Okay, this is quite a, a chunky one to get across again on two slides, so I'll do my best. Um, as you know, if we sell our main home, there is no capital gains tax to pay. 
that's because it is our main home. We've lived there. It's been our family home and we're not subject to any capital gains tax at all on that property. There has been a few cases on the principal private residence relief over the last few years and all that's done really is just hammered home the points. It does need to be your home. You do need to use it as a home where your family are, where your bank statements go, where you pay the council tax. But this may well be something that, you know, in the future you can use. There's two scenarios really that we would look at putting this election in place. Um, one, say you want to move for work and you want to rent out your home. Rather than sell it, you're going to rent it out and go and buy another one. Okay. That first home has been your main residence. So when you come to sell that property, we will look at the entire period of ownership of that property to determine how much PPR relief you can get. The rules are currently quite generous. They were generous even more so until a few years ago, but they're still good. Um, say, for argument's sake, I bought a property 10 years ago. I lived in it for three and a half years, and then I rented it out. Under the current rules for PPR relief, the three and a half years that I lived there, it's exempt, the gain's exempt, and the last 18 months of ownership is exempt. Mental mass is easy for me tonight. Obviously, five years out of the 10 is exempt. So 50% of the capital gain is exempt because at one point that property has been my main home. And once it's got the little cross on the top, as I like to think of it, you will always get the last 18 months regardless. So again, it may happen, possibly accidental landlords that are, you know, if you want to move house but you can't sell yours, it is quite common. It's just being aware, really, that that relief is there when you come to sell the property. Another instant of PPR relief would be where potentially you have two homes available to you. Say, you know, one of you gets a job in London, two-year contract, and rather than rent a flat there Monday to Friday, you decide to buy a flat. It costs you the same. Okay, we're going to buy the flat, and hopefully, you know, when two years' time comes, we'll be able to sell it a bit of money. So you do that, and then because you do have two properties available to you, you do need to make an election with the revenue, and you do need to say which one is going to be your PPR. So in this situation, you would buy the flat in London, and you would then nominate that property to be your PPR. You would then move that election back three, six months later. We use six months just for my uh, mental mass here. Um, so six months later, I move the election back to my house here. So what have we got then if we sell it in two years' time? Well, we've got a property that was our PPR, elected with the revenue, for six months. The last 18 months is deemed to be my PPR anyway. So the property that I've owned for two years, I've got full exemption. So the flat in London could go up by 50,000 in two years. I sell it, I claim PPR relief, I don't pay any capital gains tax. Just one point to note on that is if you are a married couple or a civil partnership, you do need to make joint elections. So in the case of maybe a partner get moving to London and, and buying the property and making the election, both parties in that scenario would need to move the election jointly to the property in, in London. If you're unmarried, you have completely independent elections, so you can do what you like, but on a married couple or civil partnership, you do need to ensure that you both make the election together jointly. Another generous relief, um, which didn't go yesterday, is lettings relief. Um, I've just covered PPR, so the property that I've bought 10 years ago that I'm now looking to sell, the board decided I get 50% exemption because it was my PPR, on top of that, I can look to claim nettings relief. It's a couple of complicated formulas, but in essence, again, another f further relief with a maximum um, further deduction of £40,000. Married couple, civil partners, that's £80,000 between them. So the scenario of me having my property, living it three and a half years, renting it out, selling it after 10 years, my tax exposure is probably quite minimum. Take into account my annual exemption of 11,100. You know, we're talking probably quite a minimal amount of tax, if any, in that situation. And again, it's just being aware that these reliefs are here if you do come to sell a property that you have had as your main home. The last slide, capital gains tax planning. As I mentioned previously on equalising the income, if you're a husband and wife or civil partners, any transfer of assets between you does not give rise to a capital gains tax liability. 
it may well be that you're in this situation and only one of you owns a rental property. So one of you is declaring the income on your self-assessment tax return each year. The other one doesn't because they don't own it. But every individual gets an annual exemption of £11,100 a year. So if you are in that situation, then you can transfer a percentage to your spouse. It doesn't give rise to any capital gains tax issue. But when you do come to sell the property, what it does mean is that you're using two annual exemptions. So we're getting £22,200 of gain between you before you start paying any tax. And just for a figure on that, um, if you are a higher rate taxpayer at 40%, just by moving the percentage shares and utilising your spouse's annual exemption, you will save capital gains tax of over £3,000. The transfer does need to be done before exchange. So all of this planning, again, it's just knowing that these things are here so that when you are in the position of potentially selling, you know you can put the appropriate documents in place to ensure that you maximise your release. I think we'll save the, uh, any questions until the end. Um, I will now pass over to your mortgage specialist. <laughs> Good evening everybody, I'm just making sure I didn't trip over the wires first of all because it would be a good start, so uh, uh, thank you for everyone being here tonight, similar to Karen and Debbie's comments. I'm the mortgage advisor, my name's John Fry, I work in Canesham and also in Downend in Bristol, um, so feel free to pop in any time, more than happy to help with any, uh, any questions or queries. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is talk a bit about um, gearing, so uh, w what this means is you, you may have heard of gearing in the investment world. Uh, this is similar for the, for the mortgage world. Um, it, it's just a way of planning your investment. So if you've got some cash to invest in a buy-to-let property or a couple of properties, it's just a way of careful planning with mortgages um, and just to see uh, if it's something you do want to do, of course. So um, what I'll do is I'll go through the slides now. So first of all, um, we'll look as if um, you had some money to invest, let's say £200,000. And uh, instead of buying one property, because quite a few people come to me and say, look, I've got some money to invest, I want to put it in a property, um, go for the cost, etc., stamp duty, the lender fees, etc. It's also worth bearing in mind spreading that money, so potentially getting a couple of mortgages on a couple of properties. So I'm going to run through some uh, figures now just to show the effect uh, that it makes. So one property you buy with £200,000 cash, potentially looking at rental income of £1,000 a month, so £12,000 per annum. Say we split that down to, say, four properties. I'm excluding stamp duty, uh, solicitor fees, etc. at the moment in time, but just for simplicity of the calculation. Appreciate there's lots of figures uh, quite late on a night, so uh, I'll run through these uh, with you. So purchase price, £200,000 for the four properties. So £800,000 in, in total. Deposit of £50,000. What I'm getting here is putting down 25% deposit for your mortgages. Potentially you could put down slightly more or slightly less. Minimum usage is around about 20% um, to put down. Some lenders will look at that in terms of interest rates. Um, but ideally around about 60% to get the better rates. Okay? So with this one, uh, looking at mortgages, four mortgages, £150,000 uh, each. Um, rental income of those properties, again, £12,000 per annum as per the one property. Mortgage payments, we're saying here £6,750, which is around about 4.5% interest rate. Uh, for the purpose of the calculation, I mean, the rates do vary, obviously, depending on specific um, circumstances. Mainly when we do a bespoke illustration, you realise how, how much uh, the rates are and how much you can borrow, etc. Um, and in terms of uh, the net income uh, for those, we're looking at £5,250 per property. So you can see the effect uh, previously for £12,000 per annum, as opposed to potentially getting £21,000. So as you can see, there is a potential here, uh, but with gearing, it does come with a risk as well. So, if property prices increase by 10%, the good news, obviously, that, that one property you're seeing 20,000 pounds, for example, we're saying here, um, property growth on the four properties, 80,000 pounds, so there's good growth potential as well. So the advantages, so increased opportunity for capital growth uh, and also rental income on those properties, deductible expenses for income tax purposes, as uh, covered by Karen earlier in the, uh, in the presentation. Um, disadvantages, um, the main thing is really is, is more property management as well. So through Andrews, um, particularly on the letting side, they can fully manage your properties uh, for you as well. 
um, they can discuss that with yourself. Um, but in terms of administration, if you're doing it yourself as well, it's something to bear in mind uh, that if you want to take on more than one property, you may want to do it bite sized take on one first of all and build up, or take on several at once. So just something to bear in mind for, from that side. Um, obviously, less equity in each property because you're spreading your, in, your, your cash investment between uh, several properties instead of just the one property. Um, and also the tax implications, as per covered by Karen earlier tonight as well, particularly the higher rental income and capital gains, um, it may put you in a higher tax bracket as well. So it's something that we're speaking to, to, to Karen about if there's anything you need clarification around that. So accessing the best buy-to-let deals uh, on the market. As I said, typically you need around 25% is your deposit uh, for your buy-to-let. Um, there are cheaper rates, but they start with a 60% loan to vice. That's 40% putting down as your deposit. Uh, the property needs to be in a lettable condition. Uh, what I mean by that is um, it's got to be uh, in a condition which is market ready, ready to go, people move into. Um, the reason for that is because when a surveyor will go out to value the property, they want to make sure that it's worth the rental income uh, that you're declaring for that property that you're, you're buying. So it's got to make sure that it's in a lettable condition, ready to go. Okay. Um, on average, the rental needs to cover the mortgage payment by 125% at a rate of 5%, that 5% is an interest rate, that can vary, so it depends on the lender, can go up to 6%. So the main thing to bear in mind with that is work out how much potential rental you're going to get for that property per month, and then often you'll find with buy-to-let um, lenders, there's often a buy-to-let calculator which you can work out with the income um, and also property price, etc. So you can work out uh, those figures, but again, uh, any help on the mortgage side, uh, happy to help here at Andrews. Uh, and also look out for higher arrangement fees. So sometimes you may find a deal which is really cheap, interest, you think, ah, oh, fantastic. But then the arrangement fees could go up to about £4,000. So then you've got to think, is it worth weighing that up as well? Um, but normally when I sit down with my clients, I work out which is the best deal for them as well. So Andrew's Mortgage Services, uh, we're independent mortgage advice, so it means we can access the whole of the market for you to obviously get you the best deal possible. Um, in terms of that, it means that we potentially could get better rates than us on the high street. Um, specialist buy to let knowledge, uh, also we cover residential remortgages etc so we do all that side anyway um, but happy to help with any specific uh, um, uh, situation for yourself uh, and exclusive rates for our partnership through legal and general as well so we can get some good rates for the particular mortgage club that we use. Um, also we could um, provide advice uh, on, on protecting your portfolio as well so not just in terms of landlord's insurance um, but also in terms of any life insurance critical illness, income protection, to make sure you're fully covered as well. If anything happens to you, more than happy to look at that uh, where possible. Saves you time and, en uh, time and energy, and energy and money really. So um, again, with my clients, the, the main thing I, I explain to them is when they come to see me, at the end of the day, they want to know how much they can borrow, how much it costs. That's the two main variables. Once we've got that, I make sure that they're happy with that, happy with what I've discussed with them. And also I'll take them through the whole journey to the moment they get the keys as well. So I'm always with you on the whole process. You've obviously got your day-to-day -day work to do, um, so you don't really want to be chasing solicitors, chasing lenders, etc. Let me do that, and I'll do all the hard work for you. Uh, also award-winning as well. Uh, we've got very high standards in terms of our feedback from clients as well, um, and also from our business assurance awards, which is the, which is the compliance, the quality. Um, three of the last four years, we've, we've hit top marks on that as well, which is uh, reassuring to know. Um, and also we are... Um, recommended highly from uh, family and friends as well. Okay, I'm just going to pass you back on to Debbie, who's just going to cover the last few bits. Thank you very much for your time. in terms of if people are looking to invest in further properties and expand their portfolio like I say we will have um, we've got lists of various properties I think we've got a selection of around about 20 plus properties scattered all around areas of Bristol and Bath if you're interested just giving you some examples of properties and the yields that you can get but if you if you're going to look to expand your portfolio the main thing we say is is get market ready and by that we mean is actually get ready in terms of actually um, getting all your finance in place, think about the tax planning and everything as well as to what you want to do and what you want to achieve out of it. And be willing to actually act quickly as well. It is a market that's fast moving. There isn't an awful lot of stock around at any one time. So if you've got the finance and you've got a mortgage approval um, in place, it does mean that if you're competing against other um, investors looking to purchase or, or just 
normal people looking to actually ex um, buy other property, that you're actually best placed to get your offer accepted on the property. Um, and in terms of being able, is actually is actually committed to that and doing, and also thinking before you buy this property, I would strongly recommend that you take some advice from letting agents, and we we do cover the whole of Bristol Bath. We've got Gloucestershire as well, Oxfordshire. So if you're not just restricting to the local areas, but looking to go further afield, we can give you advice, um, and um, you know sort of do that. And and from that point of view, we can actually sit down and talk to you about specific properties. We can also, one of the things that we've actually been doing for a lot of our investors is actually if you whittle down to a couple of properties that you're interested in, we've gone and looked at those properties for you, um, with you as well and sort of second viewings and really narrowed it down so that you're making the best choice possible. And that's a free service that we're happy to do. Um, in terms of what next, um, we're going to do a QA and a at the moment, but just to, I don't know if anybody's in, um, already registered for this, but just to let you know that we do have Andrew's Investor Club. Um, and if you've got a portfolio already, but perhaps you've never had it assessed as to is it maximising the income in terms of does it need any refurbishment, um, whether you're thinking, shall I sell one of these, purchase something else, we can give you advice. We've got a, a um, David Petrie is our specialist and he can give you some independent advice on that. Um, we can also do in terms of actually how you can expand it if you want to expand in the areas. We have properties specifically that have put into the investor club. Quite often we have some landlords who do want to dispose of a, a property for whatever reason and quite often they want to dispose of it with the tenant in. That would be ideal if you're looking to purchase another property with a tenant from day one paying, um, paying your rental. Um, and so that's something that we can actually help with or it just may be other properties that are available or even if you're considering purchasing a block with a couple of properties in, we have, we've had those sort of um, examples in the past as well. Um, and like I say, we can actually advise you on how to maximise your own portfolio. It's a, an independent service and um, they can talk about the gearing um, and obviously the tax specialist side of things as well. Um, we've got details, I think everybody's had a handout of the presentation, if you haven't we'll have some more on your way out, but um, we've got details there of the people that you need to contact. So now I'd like to open it out and ask if anybody has got any questions that they'd like to ask, um, and I'll ask John and Karen to come back up. Any questions aimed at all three of us basically, quite happy to take any questions. Anybody at all? Uh, gentleman at the back. Correct, yeah. Yeah, there is. I mean, in, ter in terms of the actual advice itself, we, we, we always pride ourselves on not actually charging a fee for the advice. So we can sit down with you, have a free consultation. Um, if, we then if you then decide to proceed with what we've offered, um, there is a various charging structure in place. Standard fees um, varies from 400 to 600 pounds. Um, obviously, depends on the uh, on this on particularly what you need and the, and the situation for the mortgage. We charge on, on application, so when, once you're happy to proceed with the application at that stage, uh, we then take payment and then continue with the mortgage application from there. Okay. A uh, you I mentioned that you could claim mileage for a step. Could you tell us what the rate was? It's 45 pence per mile. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the first year when you're buying a property, you've got uh, you know, um, stamp duty, you've handmade a mortgage advisor fee. Is that classed as the cost of purchase, so it's capital gains one, or is it classed yeah. as an income tax? It's, it's capital gains one. So well, anything to do with the purchase is... Yeah. Stamp gains. duty, the legal fees, the actual cost itself. Keep all of that ready for when you come to sell the property in years to come. Yes, the lady there. Uh, you said about things like carpets not being allowed yep. as an expense. So <coughs> you know, there's the cost of the property, but then... If during the course of earning the property you may have to replace the washing machine three or four times, carpets three or four times, so it could just go on capital each And you, you don't get relief at all? Nothing at all. Not since April 2013, unfortunately. One, one thing to bear in mind actually from a rental perspective in terms of letting property, um, most, a lot of tenants now are accumulating a lot of their own items, so quite often if you let an unfurnished property, you really only need to put a cooker in, and quite often on more modern properties that might be an integral appliance, which would come, if it, that needed replacing, that, that would be an allowable expense. 
So there's not always a necessity to put washing machines and fridges in into properties. Yeah, but they usually want good carpets and so yes, on. And yeah. You're likely to have a tenant yeah. come in and say, that carpet's worn, can you replace mm -hmm. it? And if you're not going to get any relief on it each time. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, but um, the benefit of, I, I don't know, there's the cost of you not getting that, but what you what you will get is obviously the more the higher you present your property, the more chance you've got of letting it quickly and keeping good quality tenants as well. So, but I appreciate you can't offset it from the expense, unfortunately. But what if you put in wooden flooring and you need to change that because it's worn out or got damaged? Is it the same as the longer? Yeah, I think we'll be able to clean that. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, just up in the middle. Hello. Uh, setting up a limited company, is that possible to reduce the tax? Um, limited company, yeah. I mean, you can do it. There's pros and cons to be honest, and it depends on what your what your long term is. You know, rule of thumb is if you're going to keep it for a few years, and there's two of you, you might want to just own it in your own names um, because then you get the capital gain and the exemptions. But if you've got a longer term plan, it, it could be beneficial to put it in a company. But you know, I've, I've got a flyer that I can send you if you like, just detailing the things to consider really. lived in a house and refurbed it before you let it, at what point can you start claiming the expenses? Um, it's a little bit grey to me. So if, you, if you've lived in it and you literally just sort of like redecorate it with paint um, and then let it, that, that would be fine. You just clean that in your first year. Um, but if you kind of put refurb on it while you're living in it? Yeah, while you're living in it, obviously, that it's your, it's your home, so it's a little bit great. So probably in that situation, you probably wouldn't be able to claim all of it. Gentlemen at the back. Question for Karen. Variation on the same question. Uh, a property owned, dilapidated, repairs and maintenance needed before letting. Again, a little bit great, depending on what we're actually doing in terms of the repairs. Um, the revenue changed the goalpost slightly a little while ago that if it's something you would do between tenancies then you probably could claim it. It, it depends the extent of what you're doing really, but you can know, catch me after if you like. Thank you. A lady just... Uh, oh, there was a lady there. Black and white first. Similar question, I think. Um, property, new to me, um, left a mortgage because it had a mortgage, but yeah. actually a kitchen and bathroom really scruffy, going to replace those before tenants come in. Capital cost or revenue cost? If it's, or neither. Like, if it's like the like basis, and it's, have you inherited the property or have you... No, I bought it, but yeah, it's, bought it's, it. like, it's an yeah. old kitchen for a new, new yeah, kitchen. Right. If it's like for like, it's, it's deemed to be a repair. Right. So if you've got a standard B&Q kitchen in there and you go and replace it for a standard B&Q kitchen, you claim that in full in the first year. If you do what I call a significant upgrade, so if you think actually I, I want to get the top-notch tenants, I'm going to put in granite work surfaces, it's going to be very plush, that obviously is is not a like for like and you would then say some if not all would be eligible when you come to sell it as, as an enhancement really. Okay. Better get really Okay, yeah. okay. Lady next. Is there any difference in the deduction for furnished energy values? No, as it stands currently obviously you would get the wear and tear allowance, but like I just said at the beginning that is changing from next April. So we'll know more about that next week. But as it's as it stands moment it looks to be whatever you replace you claim so there will be an automatic 10% deduction like it is currently you know if you have to replace the bed you claim the replacement of the bed so that's what it's looking like we will do more next week gentlemen in the middle if the um, rent includes all the bills and tax and gas does the 10% wear and tear is that still on the gross including all that it's, it's gross excluding what the tenant would be likely to pay themselves. Like if you pay the council tax and the water, you would have to reduce that off and then apply the 10%. But like I say, that's only until April. Mm -hmm. Jump from there. Um, I rent a house to my daughter on a charger under market rent. Does that have any impact on the expenses? I mean, it's providing that the rent is more than the expenses and you're still making a profit that should be fine um, it's when potentially you are receiving a very small amount of rent and you've got a lot of expenses on that property then you wouldn't be able to claim all of them okay. um, definitely in the middle if, uh, if you put the property uh, more towards one uh, partner or spouse for income tax purposes does that 
does that affect your capital gains tax allowance? It, it does when you come to sell. Say you know you're at 50 50 at the moment and you then move it to 80 20, say you'd want to consider the percentage before you sell the property to make sure that the person who's getting the 20% is going to make full use of their capital gains annual exemption um, and, and any basic rate that they may have at that point. Because obviously, you know, your tax rates can change over you know, the time you own the property. So it's one of those things that you know, look at from an income tax point of view, but before you come to sell, review it again to make sure you're both getting the maximum capital gains exemption. So you can you change it back to 50 50 yeah. just before the sale? Yeah. Need to put the declarations in place all prior to sell. All these things that I've covered tonight, of course, you can consider. It's just making sure you're aware, really, so that you can look to do them before the event happens. Because if you've already sold it and you're 80 20, it's, it's too late. You declare 20% of your space because 80% and that's what needs to go on the return. So, at the same point, can you, during the time, can you change the percentages you know, at any point in time? Yeah. Just need to make sure you do declarations and submit forms to the revenue. Are the declarations just at the time you do your first tax return, or do you have to do it up front when you register? You can do it whenever you want. The declaration you can do at any time. Um, it just can't be retrospective. So if you bought a property two years ago and actually one of you is a higher rate and one's a basic rate, you can't backdate the declaration to when you bought the property, but you can date it tomorrow so you can start from that point forwards with a different <coughs> share. If that had been done with the solicitor at uh, uh, remortgaging, that be yeah, as long as you've got a declaration, as long as you've got a legal declaration and you've filed a form 17 to the revenue within 60 days of that being signed. Okay, the lady from Herkham, when does the removal of the wear and tear allowance start? Next April. Okay, is that the lady at the back for the question? Don't. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> 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 I mean, there is there is lenders out there that you can you can use. Yeah, you can have a limited company. You can, you can use you can invest through them. Uh, probably the best thing to do is pick me up pick up on the end of that. If that's okay. So if you come and see me, I'm happy to uh, yeah discuss specifically on that one. No problem. Okay. Oh, we'll take one last question. Then any others will um, take individually. I think afterwards. So, gentlemen in the middle.